This is a brief explanation of how fiber optics work. Um, I'm going to start with the center two slots here. So when fiber is being produced in a factory, uh, it's being drawn at high speeds. And along that tower, there are masks. And they use UV lasers to launch through that mask to produce mirrors within the fiber optics, and usually within a 10 millimeter uh, distance. So uh, according to how it's mounted and the substrates it's mounted onto, whether it be temperature or strain or uh, a tilt or accelerometers, everything's dependent upon the reaction of the fiber uh, with the reflective mirrors. Uh, the wavelength that we use uh, with this technology is 1460 to 1620, giving you a range of 160 nanometers. So essentially, uh, by dividing that up, um, you know, by by four, then you usually get your typical number of sensors per fiber strand. Uh, typically, when you have a mix then you get 30 to 40. If you have a more consistent type on any one fiber, you can get up to 50 sensors. So that back reflection, when these are made, are made with very specific wavelengths. Now, for instance, uh, 1460, we'll take that one number and we add, say, four nanometers to it. So this one sensor operates in that range, either under compression or tension. So in turn, this information is then sent back to an optical interrogator. So essentially, there's two key components inside the interrogator. Uh, there's a tunable laser, which is what's shown in red here, is the launching of the light. And there's a detector. There's a reflection from these mirrors back to the detector. So typically, each channel has its own personal uh, detector. So when this light is reflected back, it shows that difference, say, between the 1460 and the 1464, and then mathematically can be equated into a um, mathematical uh, readout for what type of sensor you're, you're reviewing. Um, so the interrogator is very simple it doesn't uh, it's not very complicated in the way that it operates and and like John had mentioned earlier there's no power needed at the sensor itself it's only the interrogator the interrogator works off of 30 to 40 watts which is very very low so uh, it gives you the ability for alternative energy sources uh, if you need to do this uh, on any type of application so when we talk about wavelengths, I uh, put this in here as an example. This is where a green laser is being used inside of a glass tube. And you see the wave that's being formed inside. Well, this is what's happening inside the non-micron core of the fiber. And so it's, uh, it's making contact with these mirrors, the light is, and then 70% of that light is bounced back to the instrument. Uh, John had also mentioned earlier about multiplexing of sensors. And this is an example of where uh, the light is traveling through the FBGs uh, on that fiber in different locations. Uh, each one having its own, what I call a thumbprint. So there's no way to, uh, to get mixed up as to which type of sensor you're looking at because uh, we would associate it in a map with a wavelength specific to that sensor. So this could have multiple, you know, up to 50 types of wavelengths uh, on the one fiber. There's only two types of fiber. There's multi-core, uh, multi-mode uh, fiber, and there's single-mode fiber. The technology that we're presenting today is single-mode technology. A lot of reasoning for that is distance. Uh, being able to carry uh, up to 25 kilometers without any assistance uh, 
to gather information from a sensor and its FBG. Uh, Multi-mode fiber is good for short distances carrying a large bandwidth. And today, our internet is all based upon single-mode uh, fiber with a 9 micron core and 125 micron outer diameter. Uh, when it comes to the types of cables that you would use, as fire retardant, you know, block, water block type cables, you can get armored cables. Uh, so there's many, many different types for different types of applications. Um, so, and then also one of the key features back in uh, 2007, uh, I had spoke uh, with a optical company, and at that time they uh, decided to add a bittering agent to the jacket. So what, what does that do? By adding a bittering agent to the jacket, um, if uh, you're placing this fiber on an existing bridge, uh, you don't have to worry about rodents or birds. Uh, it is EPA approved uh, impregnation. Uh, so it gives off a very nasty uh, taste uh, to any kind of rodent that may try to bite it or, or birds and deter them from doing that. So a lot of uh, one of the case studies I'm going to show you on I-20, all the cable is actually exposed and just mounted with clips uh, to the structure. Whereas Indian River, uh, which will be one of the case studies, uh, since it was a new construction, conduit was already provided uh, to run fiber in various locations, but not that it's necessary. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the maturity of uh, fiber optics has come a long way. So there's all kinds of varieties of sensors that you can choose from, and this is just a few uh, that are on the market. What CEL specializes in is there are types of sensors that were not available, uh, like long strokes, long uh, strokes for, for long displacements. There were short displacements, but not long displacements, and rotary um, optical sensors, uh, crack sensors uh, to do X, Y, and Z uh, crack uh, displacement on uh, concrete bridges. Uh, another example is the Brainy Bolt. The bolt, anywhere from a half inch up to any any size larger than that, uh, it, it has optics on the interior of the bolt, and it also has a temperature sensor to uh, to compensate with that's built inside the bolt. Um, this is very valuable for any type of bolted connection and understanding the dynamics of that connection. And the other thing is, like on Indian River, uh, just so you know, on the uh, the one that's listed here is concrete embedded. This is the pipe sensor we embedded in the concrete throughout that structure. Uh, on a concrete surface mount, this is the type we would use. And if it's steel, then it would be a spot welded or epoxy. Long term, the spot welded is always uh, preferred. Uh, inclinometers uh, for any type of ground movement uh, that can be placed uh, in boreholes, uh, then this is important as well. And, you know, on one project on uh, Indian River, you'll see these switches being used, these types of switches uh, for security. Um, so I just wanted to briefly show this uh, for a second, but we also do manhole security type applications. And you'll also see where we use this platform uh, on the Indian River to know that if, if anyone is present in certain locations that are key for security. Uh, also fence line protection and leak detection. If there's anybody online that uses utilities, um, you know, gas lines or anything of that nature that are public and they're carried across a uh, structure, then this can be a valuable asset um, uh, to monitoring any types of leaks. Now, after we've looked at all of the different types of sensors, the one thing that we do is uh, in-house pre-assembly before we install on any bridge, whether it be new or existing. Um, so we arrange the fiber with the sensors uh, already attached for various channels. 
and then we package them so that we can ship them in a very secure manner so they can be uh, placed in the field. But it it does reduce a lot of field time for the uh, pre-assembly work that we do on our optical systems. A few minutes ago, I had mentioned uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, we had the opportunity and the very first people in the United States to utilize telecommunications that are already in place for a bridge in Alaska. Um, you don't have to have any of the instrumentation on the bridge, and that's very powerful. When you can do a multitude of bridges and only have sensors on those bridges and use a smart switch that's IP addressable, then that wavelength from these device from these sensors can be transmitted back to a traffic uh, management control center. Uh, Alaska, like I said, was our first opportunity. There again, the in the weather there was so severe they did not want any engineers or people having to access these bridges should a PC or unit have to be rebooted for any reason that it can be done in a very environmentally controlled environment. So this is very powerful. Uh, later, you'll see this data uh, management center being used on the Indian River, uh, where we're actually transmitting uh, information back to a traffic control center. The advantages, um, you know, when it comes to installing, you're not having to place multiple DAC units or data acquisition units. Um, you just place one if it's on the bridge itself. Uh, you don't have to have multiple instruments to do high number counts on sensors. Uh, even small sensor counts, uh, there are smaller interrogators to accommodate that as well. But the simplicity of the cabling and the flexibility of being able to uh, to add to the system at later dates without changing or adding to the infrastructure that's there is very, very valuable. Um, the integration of other types of devices, you know, over fiber by using AD converters uh, is something that we had done on Indian River where cameras and weather stations are carried over the same backbones uh, that the optical sensors are. And since they are of a different wavelength, we can run those devices over the same exact fiber with no interference to the optical sensors themselves. Plus, it's a time saving. Um, that's, that's where we gain a lot of ground. Uh, when we do installations or prepping for new applications, the time savings that's involved uh, is, um, is valuable from a cost standpoint. Now, I'm just going to mention this before I go into the long-term monitoring, is that uh, we also offer, um, you know, for small bridge programs, uh, to where they're very inexpensive handheld devices that can be used either periodically or for longer terms. Now, the one thing that we have found that's, um, that's very valuable is the uh, modeling of uh, the structures. Um, a lot of times we can just take 2D drawings on very simple applications and uh, do a layout, get approvals from the engineers and the client uh, as to where they are placed and why. But we use our models in our GUI software in teleoptics. Um, you know, there's a graphical interface that we use, so we actually take these models and break them up into zones and uh, place them into the software. Uh, this is an example of uh, some pre-recorded uh, online systems that we have to where we're using the IntelliOptics software graphical interface. There's a very powerful Microsoft Office, I mean Microsoft SQL database enterprise uh, that we um, uh, collect all the information. Um, that the software also 
uh, is very key in sending out, um, you know, weekly reports. If there happens to be a sensor in the red, like you see here, uh, then uh, you would get an immediate warning, whether it be by text, voice, uh, or email. Uh, we also analytics, you know, not just taking raw information, but being able to use those analytics, um, you know, to determine predictive analysis of future events, uh, so that you can, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, you have something that the maintenance engineer or our bridge maintenance personnel can use to actually go back and look at certain areas on a bridge in a very specific way.